Okie doke, I guess we can get started. It is 6.10 or 3.10 or 10 past the hour, wherever you are. So uh, we'll get started. So I am Anna Ballou. You may remember me from the first session. And today we are going to be talking about my favorite topic in the world, which is the intersection of sociolinguistics and language documentation. So this was a topic that some of y'all asked for last year. Uh, when we asked what topics you would like to learn about in the next year's webinar, several people said sociolinguistics, which I was very happy to see. I'm excited to talk to you all about this. 6 a.m. in Pakistan. Thank you for joining us at this hour. All right, so uh, let's just acknowledge that this is the perfect time for a fully remote webinar. I figured we'd either have nobody joining us today or a lot of people joining us today because they are stuck at home and bored. So I hope that whether you're watching now or you watch this video a little bit later, you fill your time with something fun and educational while you can't go out and see your friends. So I guess the basic question we have to start with is, what is sociolinguistics? And you can probably figure out the basics of it just from the parts of this word, socio, right? We're talking about something social, so our society, perhaps we're talking about socio-distancing. Well, here is the Linguistic Society of America's most concise definition. Language use symbolically represents fundamental dimensions of social behavior and human interaction. The notion is simple, but the ways in which language reflects behavior can often be complex and subtle. Huh. Okay, so this is a pretty complex definition. This is not that simple. Uh, let's try it again. Let's rephrase in a slightly simpler way. So sociolinguistics, we could say that this is the study of how language use represents, interacts with, and affects social structures. Or, if I wanted to make it really simple, I could say how we talk is a result of who we are and how we fit into society, and vice versa, right? So who we are and how we fit into society can also be affected by how we talk. And obviously, like Dr. Wolfram said, that is not a simple relationship. It's really complicated, really subtle, and really, really interesting. So one more little caveat. This is a really big subfield of linguistics. We could spend 20 semesters talking about sociolinguistics. I would love to do that, but we only have one hour right now, unfortunately. So there are some great textbooks that you can check out that are meant to present an introduction to sociolinguistics. Uh, Miriam Meyerhoff has two books uh, about sociolinguistics as well as sociolinguistic methods, which are really good beginner books. Uh, Wardaw and Fuller have a nice intro book. Uh, Anthony Trudgill has a pretty classic one. Penelope Eckert has some wonderful stuff on third wave sociolinguistics. There's a lot out there. If there are any specific resources you're interested in, please let me know. I would be happy to help you find some. But for today, we are just going to talk about how sociolinguistics fits into language documentation, right? Because that is what we're doing in this webinar, language documentation. So let's go back all the way back to session one. Does anybody remember our first session this year? We gave this definition of language documentation, and we said language documentation was creating a lasting, multi-purpose record of a language. So, I think it's time, finally, to modify this definition a little bit six weeks later. So, maybe we won't talk about creating a record of a language, maybe, as Himmelman does in the classic paper that started language documentation as a subfield, he defined it as a comprehensive record of the linguistic practices characteristic of a given speech community. So what is the difference between these two definitions? Well, you'll notice that what I've put in bold on each one, one of them is the record of a language and one of them is a record of linguistic practices. 
So what does this mean? What are the entailments here? Well, it means that, for one, when we move into sociolinguistic documentation, we don't only have to focus on one language. So if you are interested in documenting, I don't know, Hawaiian or Ojibwe or a specific variety of Swahili, you don't have to focus on only that language. You could document, as the definition says, all of the practices in a given speech community. And I guess we should start by talking about what a speech community is. This is a technical term that has a definition. For now, we are just talking about a group of people who use language together. So we want to look at all of the languages that are used by a given group of people. And we're going to go beyond just looking at the structure of one language. So for the past few weeks, we've been talking about how to document the sounds of a language, how to write it down, how to document words and grammar and structure, but we're going to go beyond that. We're going to go into the unknown linguistic documentation. We are trying to document all of the stuff just the we're going to look at all languages in the community, all of the varieties of those languages. So for example, if you're looking at a city in the US, you might say, okay, people here use Spanish and Mandarin and Arabic and English and French, but there might be different kinds of say English used there too. People might use Minnesota English and Texas English and Scottish English, right? So we're going to look at not only different languages, but different varieties of those languages. And if we're feeling really ambitious, we might try to figure out why people use language the way they use language, but that's getting into the deep end. The first thing we want to look at is what people are doing with language. And I do want to note that defining what a language is, is tricky enough. That's really hard. So, uh, we're just going to assume that we know what a language is and continue. <laughs> so one more thing I want to note about sociolinguistic documentation. There is this concept in a paper by Tucker Childs and Jeff Good and Alice Mitchell from 2012. This is a really wonderful paper. If you are interested in sociolinguistic documentation, I would really encourage you to go read it because this sort of started the concept of sociolinguistic documentation in the last few years. But the argument there is that linguistic ecologies, that is sort of all of the relationships between languages and a place, are more fragile than languages themselves. And so linguistic ecologies, or these sort of complex systems of different languages used in a community, tend to disappear before the languages themselves. So the ways people use their languages are a lot more subject to changing than the languages they use, if that makes sense. So that makes it especially important and really interesting to document these linguistic ecologies, these relationships between languages in a place and to learn how this kind of language use interacts with social structures. It is faster to disappear, and so it might be considered a higher priority for documentation. Plus, it's really interesting. So, one more caveat. This is a huge, huge topic, and today we're just going to do a tiny sampler of different ideas and ways to do this work. So here are the three things that you could focus on when you get started in sociolinguistic documentation. Uh, there are more topics you could work on. These are just the three we're going to talk about. So first, you could look at multilingualism, which means what languages people speak and how they use them. You might want to know which languages are used in your community and by whom. That would be multilingualism. You could also look at variation which is essentially the differences in how people speak a language. So obviously, even if two people speak the same language, they might talk a little differently. In fact, they probably do talk a little bit differently. 
and the ways they talk differently says a lot about their social identities and how they fit into their broader world. So variation is just looking at small or big differences in speech among people who speak the same language. Finally, you might also look at language attitudes and language ideologies, which are big words for what people believe and think and feel about language and specific languages or ways of talking. So first, let's talk for a minute about multilingualism. So this is the study of what languages are used by individuals or communities and how those languages are used. So this includes some pretty big questions like what language does a person speak or languages because again, most of the world is multilingual. Monolingualism is kind of weird. Uh, statistically, it's not very common. So you might look at how a person learned the languages they know. Did they learn them from their parents, their family, their teachers, their friends? Uh, did they join a hobby group that used that language? And how do they use these languages, right? Do they generally speak one language at home with their family and another one at work? Do they use one language at church or in religious services? Do they use one language to do the shopping and another language to go to the bar? These are all questions that could fall under multilingualism. And one question I love figuring out is if two people with different mother tongues or with different linguistic repertoires meet, what language are they going to use together? This is one of the critical questions when we look at language endangerment is what would force people to use a different language other than their mother tongue in a public setting? How could that affect language vitality? And what does it mean about social structure in that community? And finally, we want to look at what social roles each language fills, both for the individual, right? Do you want to use a certain language to say, aha, I am a smart person, I am educated and powerful. And do you want to use another language to say, I'm a cool person, I'm friendly, I'm fun, I'm nice, right? And similarly, are there social roles that each language fills within the community? Hmm. So for example, in my research, I wanted to look at the linguistic ecology of a specific town called Campo in Cameroon, so that I could have a better understanding of why one of the languages spoken in Campo was becoming endangered. There's a link to that talk. I'll put up these slides after.